All right, so the last keeper of this section is keeper 1.3, describing our quantitative data with numbers. So we already looked at doing it with graphs, and now we want to do it with actual numbers. So the first way that we're going to look at it is by analyzing center. And the first me measure of center that we're going to focus on is the mean. Now, most of you guys already know that the mean is just your average. So basically what you do is you add up all of your values or all of your observations, and then you divide it by the, the number of observations that you added up. So the basic formula for mean is the sum of the observations over n, which n is the number of observations, or you could list it out as x1, x2, which is like the first observation, the second observation, all the way to the nth observation, divided by the total number of observations n. Now the symbol that we use for mean is x bar. All right. Now later on we'll talk about another symbol. I mean there's several symbols that we use in in this class, but x bar is the symbol that we use for mean if we're talking about the mean of a sample. That's important. So x bar is the mean of a sample. Now if we're talking about the mean of a population, we would use a totally different symbol. Now we also have another more grown-up formula for mean, and that formula uses the Greek letter sigma, capital sigma. Um, and sigma, this letter right here, simply means to add it all up. So the formula that we could write for mean is sigma xi, which is the sum of all of your x's, divided by n, which is the total number of observations. All right, so another measure of center is the median. Now, I'm sure you guys know how to calculate the median from way back in, like, elementary school or middle school. The median is simply the, the middle number. For statistics, we call it the typical number or the typical observation. That's what our median is. So basically, to find the median, you put all your data um, in order from smallest to largest. Um, and then you find the middle of that data set. Now, if the number of observations is odd, then the middle is the middle number. But if it's even, if the observations are even, then you have to take the average of the two middle numbers. All right, so here's an example of the commuting times of 20 randomly selected New York workers. So if I wanted to find the mean, I would again add up all of my data values and then divide it by the total, which is 20, to get my mean of 31.25. Notice again, this is a sample of New York workers, so we're using X bar. Now if I wanted to find the median, I would list out my data in order. Now you don't have to do it the way I did it, you could have just listed it in order, but oftentimes it's nice to go ahead and do like a stem and leaf plot to order it to make it nice and easy to see. And once you get it in order, well then you find your middle value. And in this case, because 20 is an even number, we have two middle values. So the two middle values is or are 20 and 25. So we add those up, divide it by 2 to find the mean of the middle to get our median of 22.5. All right, so right now we have two ways of looking at center. We have the mean and the median, but both of those measures tell us something way different. So like if you go back to the last slide, um, the mean and the median were not the same. They weren't, they really weren't even close. So you wanna make sure that you know when to use what. So when you're comparing the mean and the median, you wanna remember that um, if your data is roughly symmetric, your mean and your median will be very close together, like 20 and 21, all right? That only happens if your data is symmetric. If your data is exactly symmetric, then your mean and your median will be exactly the same. But if your um, data is skewed, either right or skewed left, the mean will always be farther out in the, in the direction of the tail of your distribution. All right, so the next thing we want to look at is measuring spread. The first way we want to measure spread is using our inner quartile range. So to find our inner quartile range, you first have to, have to find your quartiles. To find your quartiles, the first thing, again, just like for your median, you arrange your data from smallest to largest. You find the median, which is the middle. And then for your first quartile, or Q1, you find the middle of the lower half. So once you find the middle of the entire data set, you look at just the lower half of data, 
the stuff to the left of the median and you find the middle of that. Um, and then if you want to do your third quartile or your Q3, you find the middle of the upper half of your data. So once you have your Q1 and your Q3, the next thing you would do is you would calculate your interquartile range, which is your IQR, and you simply do that by doing Q3 minus Q1. So again, if we take our 20 randomly selected New York workers, um, if we order the data from smallest to largest, we know that our median is going to be, since there's 20 of them, our median should be between the 10th and the 11th um, observation. So our median is 22.5. And then for our Q1, we're going to look at our lower half of the data, so from 5 all the way up to this 20 and we're going to find the middle of that. So that's going to be between the fifth and the sixth observation. Well, the number between 15 and 15 is just 15. So our Q1 is 15. Now, if we want our Q3, we look for the middle of our upper half. So from 25 right here to 85, we're going to look for the middle of that, which would happen between 40 and 45, and we'd get 42.5 for our Q3. Therefore, if we wanted to calculate our interquartile range, I'd take my Q3, which was 42.5, minus Q1, which was 15, and I get 27.5 minutes. The way that you interpret or the way that you read the interquartile range is the range of the middle half of your data. All right, so for this example, I would say the range of the middle half of travel times for New Yorkers in this sample is 27.5. All right, so up until this point, when we talked about outliers, um, we said, like, it's a potential outlier or it's possibly an outlier. Well, from here on out, you're going to actually calculate your outliers. And in order to calculate your outliers, you have to use your interquartile range. So what we have here is uh, the definition for calculating your outliers, and it's called the 1.5 times IQR rule. All right, so basically, if you have an observation that falls more than 1.5 times IQR above the third or below the first quartile. Let me say that again because the bell is ringing. So if you have an observation that, that is more than 1.5 times IQR above the third quartile or below the first quartile, then you definitely have outlier. So if you look on page 57 of your text, you have an example, um, again, of your travel times for New York, um, New York workers. So we already calculated our Q1 was 15, our Q3 is 42.5, and our IQR is 27.5. So if we want to see if we have any outliers, I'm going to do 1.5 times IQR, which is 27.5, to get 41.25. Now to determine the outliers, I'm going to take that and I'm going to subtract it from my first quartile and add it to my third quartile. So here I have my first quartile, which was 15, minus my 1.5 times IQR to get negative 26.25. And then here I'm going to take my Q3 plus IQR times um, 1.5 to get 83.75. So basically what this is saying is that if I have any value less than negative 26.25, or greater than 83.75, then I have an outlier. Well, the negative 26.25 is kind of, I mean, it's kind of irrelevant. Uh, there's no way to have a negative travel time to work. So I know that I, this is telling me I have no lower outliers. But the 83.75 is my real concern. I want to make sure that I don't have any observation greater than 83.75. Well, if you look at your observations again, you see that 85 is the largest observation that you have, um, which is greater than 83.75, so 85 is considered an outlier of this data set. All right, so taking everything that we've learned so far, we have our median, our Q1, our Q3, and if we add our minimum and our maximum values, we can create a five-number summary. So your five-number summary consists of the minimum, the Q1, the median, the Q3, and the maximum. We use the five-number summary to create box plots or box and whisker plots. 
The way we make our box and whiskers plot is we draw and label a number line that includes the range of the distribution, so we want to include every value in our distribution. Um, we want to draw a central box from Q1 to Q3. Uh, the median should be inside of your box. And then you want to extend the lines or the whiskers to the minimum and maximum values. We do not include outliers. All right, so for our New York travel times, again, if we put our data in order, we know where our Q1, our Q3, our medium, uh, median is. So again, for our median, it goes in the middle. Our Q1 and our Q3, that's the outline of our box. And then we have our whiskers to our minimum and our whiskers to our maximum. And again, remember, 85 was an outlier of our, our data set, so I put a little dot or a star kind of far out representing the outlier. Notice that since 85 was an outlier, my maximum value becomes the next value that wasn't an outlier, which was 65 in this case. All right, so we have one more measure for spread, which this one is actually the most common measure for spread. It looks at, it looks at how far each observation deviates from the mean. So again, our standard deviation, which is the most common measure for spread, looks at how far each um, observation deviates from the mean. So if we think about, or if we look at this data of the number of pets owned by a group of nine children, we have our distribution drawn below as a dot plot. If we want to calculate our standard deviation, the first thing we would do is we would calculate the mean and then we would calculate each deviation, which is just the observation minus the mean. So in this case, the mean is five, and we can calculate each deviation. For instance, if I wanted to calculate the deviation of this point, I would do one, the observation is one, minus the mean, which was five, to get a deviation of negative four. If I wanted to do it for, uh, let's say this point, eight, I would do eight minus the mean of five, which gives me a deviation of three. All right. All right, so here again, we have our distribution. Um, we have our values, our x values, our x i values, which is just the observations. Um, and then what we would do is we would take each of the deviations that we calculated on the previous side, and we would square them. So here's all of our deviations. And then I'm going to take those deviations and I'm going to square them. So negative 4 squared is 16. Negative 2 squared is 4. All right, so I'm getting the squared deviation. These are my squared deviations. All right, once you find the squared deviation, basically what you're going to do is you're going to add it all up. So I'm going to take all of these. I'm going to add them all up. I get 52. Once I get that 52, I divide it by n minus 1, or the total number of observations, which were 9, minus 1. All right, so again, I'm taking the 52, which was the sum of the squared deviations, and I'm dividing it by n minus 1, or 9 minus 1, to get 6.5. This number here is what we call our variance. Now, we'll learn more about variance later, but just understand in order to calculate the standard deviation, you first need to calculate your variance. So your variance is the squared deviation Add it all up, divide it by n minus 1. Once you get your variance, the standard deviation is really, really easy to calculate from there. You simply take the square root of that variance to get the square root of 6.5, which is 2.55. All right, so the standard deviation measures the average distance the observation is from the mean. And the way that we calculate it, just to sum it up, is we find the average of the square deviations and then taking the square root of that. That average of the square deviations is called the variance. Now be careful, it's not the true average that we know if it's not like the mean average, because when we calculate the mean, we divide by n, versus when we calculate the variance, we divide by n minus one. Just keep that in mind. So the true formulas, the actual formulas, the formulas that you'll see on your formula sheet for variance is, again, the sum of the squared deviations divide it by n minus 1, and then your standard deviation is that same formula, but it's the square root of that formula. All 
All right, so when we, when we go to choose our center and spread, we have two different choices. The first choice is we could choose mean as our center and standard deviation as our spread, or we can use median as our center and interquartile range as our spread. Note that these two things always go together, mean and standard deviation, and then median and interquartile range always go together. You don't want to mix them up. Like, you want to do mean and interquartile range. That doesn't make sense. You use mean and standard deviation, or you can use median and interquartile range. All right, so generally, you use the median and the interquartile range if your data is skewed. All right. You don't want to use the mean because the mean is going to pull out towards the tail of your data. You want to use something that's actually going to represent the middle, which would be your mean, your median. So you'd use the median in the interquartile range. Now, if your data is fairly symmetric and you don't have any outliers, then you can go ahead and use the mean and the standard deviation. But otherwise, you want to use the median in the interquartile range. And remember, you don't want to just use your numerical summaries. You don't want to just calculate the mean or calculate the median. You also want to include a graph somehow. You want to plot your data to get a better idea of the shape of the distribution.